Hello class, today we're going to focus on solubility and the solubility product in the last section of, um, of chapter 17. Uh, before we get into solubility product, I just want to point out this uh, particular slide. Uh, when you have uh, a polyprotic acid, in this case it's um, sulfurous acid, and you do a titration, if the Ka1 is much larger than Ka2, you can actually see uh, two inflection points or two equivalence points there. So um, I think it's worth noting. I don't expect you to do a problem like this. Um, it's, I don't think it's worth doing as far as what we're doing in this class. But uh, it is worth, you know, maybe you see this in a... Um, in the lab, but here's the first inflection point. So that's where our equivalence point, and that's where the um, sulfurous acid loses its, uh, you know, it's reacting with sodium hydroxide, and uh, it loses its first acidic proton. And so then we have the hydrogen sulfide ion plus water. And this is the conjugate base of a weak acid, so it's still an acid though. So we have this another another acidic um, proton here, and the hydroxide ion reacts with that, and we get uh, the sulfide ion plus water. So this equivalence point is reflected here, and this equivalence point is reflected up here. Just something to keep in mind that yes, uh, anytime you have a polyprotic, in this case a diprotic acid, and the other big thing, this is what's really, the Ka's are much different, uh, then you can actually see those inflection points when you uh, do an experiment. I'm going to move through these. I think this is more in line with the lab. Um, the only thing that I want to point out here, to me the most important part, and we've kind of talked about this already, that the pKa and the indicator, uh, the pKa of the indicator and the pH of the equivalence point, we want something that's close there. So that uh, when you look at this graph, this plot over here, it's colorless, colorless, and then it changes to the lightest of pink. And you, we know the equivalence point of a strong acid with a strong base, the equivalence point would actually be down here at 7. So this must be, a, what, a weak acid with a strong base. But, you know, you want the change to occur in the endpoint somewhere in here, or at least have the endpoint change somewhere between here and here. So that just keep that in mind, near the equivalence point. All right, so again, with that said, here's the ultimate. Uh, when the indicator is approximately one, the color will mix, be a mix of colors. When it's greater than 10, the color will be a color of the uh, conjugate base, and if it's less than 0.1, uh, it'll be the color of the acidic indicator. So that's what we like about phenolphthalein. If you look up here, it's nice and colorless, and then it oops, and then it changes to a nice pink color, and uh, it's a nice dramatic change here. Whereas methyl red, yeah, maybe between here and here, um, that's probably a pretty good one. Uh, but again, and you could use methyl red. Both of these could be used for around a pH of seven, right? This before seven, and then it changes to yellow. Here you're at colorless till pH of eight. So both of these are good indicators for a strong acid, strong base titration. And that's a range. I don't know if you have a problem that is associated with this, but you may want to look at this table and it'll talk about where the endpoints occur, at what pH range, and what the colors are in the range. Uh, so that's worth looking at. Uh, again, it's more applied than I think uh, what we do in a lecture, but it's worth looking at. All right, so this is the focus of this lecture, and that is another equilibrium constant. We've had Kc, which is equilibrium at concentration. We've had Kp, equilibrium constant at constant pressure. Uh, we've had 
KW, the ion product constant of water. We have KA, the acid ionization constant. We've had KB, the basicity constant. Uh, and now we have one more constant to go over, and that is called the solubility product constant. All right? So we're working with ionic substances. And so just to kind of give you an idea or kind of um, make you think about what we've done in the past, in Chem, General College Chemistry 1, we asked you to memorize the solubility rules. And I would tell you to go back and look at the solubility rules and memorize what substances are soluble and insoluble in water. It's not, I would just memorize what's soluble and then assume everything else is insoluble. That's the easiest thing to do. But you want to go back and look at those uh, solubility rules. Uh, I believe it's in chapter four. So uh, if you go back to the solubility rules, you'll remember that all chlorides, bromides, and iodides are water soluble with the exception of silver, mercury, and lead. And so we have silver chloride, and we would say that that's a solid. Well, in reality, some of this does dissolve. Some of this does dissolve, and there is an equilibrium between the silver ion aqueous and the chloride ion aqueous. So what you're thinking, what you should be thinking about is you've got a beaker here. It's got a certain amount of water in it at a particular temperature because solubility is affected by temperature and you have this pile of uh, precipitate solid uh, silver chloride in here and at any given time some of the silver chloride is dissolving into these ions and at any given time oops, my pie, uh, some of the ions go back into the solid so that's what the uh, we know this is a dynamic equilibrium and so here's our dynamic equilibrium between solid going into solution and solution ions uh, returning as a solid. So if I asked you to write this, uh, the uh, equilibrium expression for this uh, chemical reaction, or this, it's not actually a chemical reaction, uh, for this process, uh, what would you write down? So write that down now or hit pause and, and write down the equilibrium expression for this reaction. All right, so what you should get is K, the equilibrium constant, equals the products, which is the concentration of the silver ion times the concentration of the chloride ion. And because we're dealing with uh, a solid dissolving in aqueous solution, we call it KSP, the solubility product constant. So again, it's an equilibrium constant. This entire thing is called an equilibrium expression so we still have an expression. Uh, we say, why isn't this in the expression? Because pure solids and pure liquids, um, their concentration, as long as they're present, like it is over here, uh, their concentration does not change relative to these two lines that were initially zero, and now we have some concentration. So again, pure solids and pure liquids are actually integrated into the solubility product constant. So let me, uh, let, me, let me say, I'll tell you what I find most students uh, miss the most in this section. The difference between solubility and solubility product. So solubility, you may want to look up the definition of solubility, but it's general, I mean, in the general form, it's the amount of solute that will dissolve in a given amount of solution, the total, if you want to think of it that way. And it is at a particular temperature. So generally we say something like grams of solute per 100 grams of solution at 25 degrees Celsius or something like that. So that's solubility. How much of the substance will dissolve in a given amount of solution at a particular temperature? And again, 25 degrees Celsius is used a lot because it's room, we, that's our room temperature. So here's the general equation. So this may look complex. It's not actually that complex. So what we have here, we have a metal 
and we have a nonmetal. Or it could be a polyatomic and a polyatomic, but it's an ionic compound. So we're dealing with electrolytes. We have uh, compounds uh, that are ionic that when we dissolve them in water, we get the metal with a certain charge, we get the nonmetal with a certain charge, and then we get certain numbers of moles of these, depending on what the uh, subscripts are in the original compound formula. So this is the general equation, uh, and when we go to write the equilibrium expression called the solubility product expression, uh, we have the concentrations of the metal ion and the nonmetal ion raised to the powers of the coefficients in front of the ion uh, chart, the chart in front of the ions. Let's just say that. All right. So that's the general form. So make sure you understand the general form. And because we're talking about solid dissolving in uh, solution, we are specifically talking about a solubility product expression or solubility constant. So here's the specific form. We have lead chloride. Again, if you go back and look at your solubility rules, it says all chlorides, bromides, and iodides are water soluble except silver, mercury, and lead. Well, here it is. Here's lead to chloride. Remember the two is the Roman numeral. And in 170, you said it doesn't dissolve. Well, it does. It does dissolve a little bit. So here's what we get. Lead, two positive ions, and two chloride ions. And again, both of these are aqueous, and this is the solid. So we write the expression. It's the products over the reactants, but because the reactants are solid, it's not, and we don't see it in the expression because it's integrated into the solubility product constant. All right. So inside here, this is called molar solubility. How many moles of lead to ion are dissolved in a liter solution? And out here, that is the solubility product. It's a constant. It is an equilibrium expression or constant, equilibrium constant. So just keep that in mind. There's a difference between this and what we call solubility. And specifically what we have here is not just solubility, it's molar solubility because you know that when you have brackets these represent concentrations in molarity units which is moles per liter so that's why we call it molar solubility. So here we have all these different compounds. You're probably going to refer to this table to get the equilibrium constants or the solubility product constants. So just make a note that you probably during your assignment uh, maybe the quiz, you need to have this available along with those um, KAs and KBs for the acids. But here they are. Um, again, you should know at this point that the uh, smaller the number, the smaller the solubility product constant, the more the product, the reactant is favored over the product. So again, something with um, a solubility product of 3.72 times 10 to the negative 19th it's mostly going to stay as a solid in water. Very little of this is going to dissociate into an iron 2 ion and a sulfide 2 negative ion. So just keep that in mind. All right, so then we talk about, again, solubility, the amount of solute that will dissolve in a given amount of solution at a particular temperature. We've defined that. Molar solubility, the only difference between these two, instead of saying grams, it's uh, per 100 grams of solution or something, or something like that, or 1,000 grams of solution, we generally say moles per liter, because that's what molar means, right? Molarity, moles per liter. So this is what we use the most in our calculations, molar solubility. So if they give you the mass of the substance that's being dissolved, which is realistic because you have to weigh it out on a balance and then transfer that into a certain amount of liquid or add a certain amount of liquid to make a solution. A lot of times you're given the mass of the substance and you're going to have to use molar mass to convert that to moles of substance and then divide by the total volume of the solution to get moles per liter, which is molar solubility. All right, so molar solubility, if you want to calculate it based on the KSP, um, you know um, how many moles of each. So look at how this works. You have the N plus the M. Um, and so you have KSP divided by N um, and 
raised to whatever uh, the coefficient is here and m raised to what x whatever the coefficient is here now there's a mistake here there should be an x here I believe it should be an x there let's check this out let's just prove that that's right um, let's see So what they're saying here is like um, this has nothing to play, right? Because that's just a solid. So how much of this dissolves is S and how much of this dissolves is S raised to the N power and this to the N power, M power, if you want to do it that way. And that's what plugs in here. And then that's equal to the KSP. So what you have is KSP equals S raised to some power n and then you have the s raised to some power m and so because these are squared if this is an s and s you're going to get s squared and the m plus m that's where we get this and so we got to take the square so what we're going to have here is s uh, raised to the n plus m because remember you add exponents when you multiply them equals ksp to solve for the s by itself, which is the molar solubility, you're going to have to take the square root of both sides, because it, it's definitely s squared uh, times n plus n. All right, so that's what they're getting at there. So you got to get the KSP over n raised to the n, m raised to the n, and then the square root. All right, so let's look at a problem here that. Um, that helps us well let's define this and we'll go here all right so molar solubility is related to KSP uh, the more that dissolves the higher the KSP is going to be that makes sense because as you go more to the as you go more from um, reactants to products all right the more product form uh, we know that the higher the K value should be the reactions favoring the products and so that means a greater solubility here KSP values of compounds cannot always be compared, all right? Um, and for KSP values to be compared, the compounds must have the uh, same dissociation stoichiometry. So what they're saying here is, our, it's hard to compare silver chloride, which then dissolves into a silver ion and a chloride ion, versus something like um, iron... Iron three oxide. Let's see, iron three oxide, which would dissolve into two iron ions, iron three positive ions, plus three oxygen ions. So that would be hard to compare their site, their KSP values because they have different coefficients here. So that's what they're talking about there. But if they have the same dissociation stoichiometry, these are all both one to one then yes, you could compare them. But if they have different dissociation stoichiometries, they produce different numbers of ions on the product side, then they can't be, the KSPs can't be compared uh, to determine. Um, they're going to be different, and they're not going to relate very well to the solubility. All right, so let's look at this problem. It says, calculate the molar solubility of lead to chloride. So right off the bat, what do we say anytime we're doing an equilibrium problem? You're going to write your balanced chemical equation. Make sure you put your phases of matter in there. So that's, that's a solid. We have a dynamic equilibrium and we're going to form lead to positive aqueous plus chlorine to chlorine negative aqueous. And then we would write the equilibrium expression for this. That would be the solubility product equals the concentration of the lead to positive ion and then the concentration of the chloride ion raised to the second power. Okay. 
so the next thing that you know is if we go back up to this equation I wish I would have written it all in one line but what you know is we're going to lose at equilibrium we're going to lose X amount of the lead 2 chloride so th this is what we've done we've taken a beaker we've added lead 2 chloride it's piled up down here and some of the lead 2 chloride starts to dissociate into the lead ion and the two chloride ions and then once that happens we eventually get an equilibrium where the ions go back in and precipitate back as a solid. So what we know is when we initially put the lead to chloride into the water, let's put our water up here, um, we're going to gain S amount of this, oh, crap. S amount of this and 2S amount of the chloride ion because it's 2 to 1. All right, let me back it up because it's looking crazy right all right so we're going to gain s amount of the lead and 2s amount of the chlorine all right so now what I want to do is I want to erase that so we're not we'll just erase all of that and that'll make it easier for us so here we go First, have a balanced chemical equation. Make sure you write the phases of the matter. Second, write the equilibrium expression called the solubility product expression. Next, we're really doing a nice table here. So that's what I said. You had to get chapter 15 down if you get it down. And then we did the ice tables in 16. Once you have that down, it's just we'll keep reapplying, reapplying the same thing over and over again. So notice they don't even put the lead to chloride in the ice table because it's a pure solid. It's integrated into the solubility product. So what we know is both of these are initially zero. We gain S amount of the lead to positive ion and we gain, because of the stoichiometry, that's why you gotta have a balanced chemical equation, you get 2S amount of the chloride ion. At equilibrium, you have S amount of this and 2S amount of this. And the reason why we use S is to keep referring to that is the molar solubility. That's what we're trying to solve for. That's what this question is asking you to determine is the molar solubility, which is S. So you know that you're going to then have uh, KSP equals uh, S for the lead, and then you're going to have 2S here for the chlorine or the chloride ion, and that's going to be raised to the second power. So you have that. So at this time, you would say, well, this problem's unsolvable uh, because I have an unknown here and I have an unknown here. But that's why I said you have to refer to that table, and we're going to find the solubility product for lead to chloride. Okay, so let me erase that because it's getting confusing. All right, so that's all we have. 2s times 2s. I like to keep the brackets, but that's okay. So we get a t here's where I see a lot of students make a mistake. So you got 2s squared, that's 4s squared, and then you multiply another s, that's 4s cubed. All right. So we've added the exponents, and that's a total of three. So that's where, let's go back to this slide here. That's where this was 1 plus 1 or n plus m. So if this is if this is a 1 and this was a 2, like lead 2 chloride, then you add those two exponents together, and that's where you get the cube. This becomes a 3 here. So that's what we see that this is 3. Okay, it's a cube. So now we to solve for S, what we're doing is we're dividing both sides by 4. That gives us KSP over 4, and then take the cube root of both sides to get S by itself. You find the solu you find the uh, solubility product for lead to chloride on the table, and uh, and then we solve 1.17 times 10 to the negative fifth divided by four. Take the cube root. We get 1.43 times 10 to the negative two molar. That's what S is. That is the molar solubility. That is the molar solubility of lead to chloride. So to me, these are some of the easier ones. I think at this point, you're kind of suffering from fatigue and you're just tired of doing these type of problems. But they're actually the easiest because the product, the reactant is a solid 
and so you don't have to worry about that in the expression and the solubility product we know that that's an equilibrium constant we can look those up in a table for a particular temperature and then instead of using X's we're saying solubility and and then two times the solubility because for every one of these that dissolves we get one lead ion and two uh, chloride ions not bad these are actually fairly easy I think the biggest problem is students not distinguishing between solubility molar solubility and solubility product all right so here's a bunch of KSPs again we could look up that iron uh, let's see it's lead to chloride so there it is lead to chloride that's where we get our number right there 1.17 times 10 to the negative fifth at 25 degrees Celsius all right so let's have you try this one here Let's see if you can do this one on your own. So hit pause, and then I'll work the problem out, and then um, we'll see if we're in agreement. All right, so for this one, again, you have to have a balanced chemical equation to begin the problem. So we're going to say iron. And when you're doing these problems, um, what you want to do is make sure that you... Um, Make sure that you work on your naming. I think it's really important that you work on your naming here. So this is called iron 2 hydroxide, or it's also called ferrous hydroxide. Ferrous hydroxide or iron 2 hydroxide. It's a solid at room temperature. And when we put it in water, it doesn't dissolve very well. And so some of it will dissolve into an iron 2 positive ion, and that's aqueous. And then we get two hydroxide ions, aqueous. And my two is not too hot there, is it? So can you already see this is going to be the same thing as the lead? I mean, what you're going to have is you're going to have the KSP equals the concentration of the iron times the concentration of the hydroxide ion raised to the second power because the coefficient of 2 here. This is going to give you S. This is going to give you 2S. This is going to give you 4S cubed when you multiply that all out. And the only difference here is we've got to find the solubility product of iron 2 hydroxide instead of um, lead 2 chloride. So we've set that equal to 4.8 7 times 10 to the negative 17th. Man, that stuff does not dissolve in water, does it? All right, so let us let me go and calculate the answer out. So we take um, 4.87 exponential negative um, 17. It's a pitiful 17. Uh, and divide that by 4. All right, so we got 1.2175 times 10 to the negative 17th power. And then on your calculator, you're going to, you know, what I would do, i just go, um, I would put a parenthesis, then I would hit my answer key, I'd close the parenthesis and raise that to the 0.33333 power. It's the one, it's cubed, right? It's a cube root. That'd be the easiest way. And you get 2.30 times 10 to the negative 6 power. So S, the solubility, the molar solubility, is equal to 2.30 times 10 to the negative 6 moles per liter. All right? Now, just be careful. If they ask you for the solubility, you know that this is in moles per liter, and you would use the molar mass of the substance to convert the moles of substance to grams of substance. That's what you would do. So be careful what they're asking for. Are they asking for solubility or molar solubility? All right, so the answer again, 2.30 times 10 to the negative 6. All right, so this we've actually already seen before too. Um, this is the common ion effect. We've talked about the common ion effect when we talked about buffers. So this is what you know. This is what the common ion effect is about. 
is it all about? So if you have a beaker of water and you add lead to chloride, again, how much lead to chloride dissolves is how much does it take that I reach the, sol the equilibrium constant, the solubility product constant at a particular temperature. So this reaction has to move over this way because these are initially zero on a nice table. So we know the reaction has to shift to the right to reach the solubility product. Well, what happens if I added some table salt to this solution? Well, we know table salt dissociates into sodium ions and chloride ions in solution. So we already have some, this isn't zero anymore. This is some number. And because it's some number, you know that this reaction doesn't have to go as far to the right to reach the solubility product constant. So that's what they mean by the addition of a soluble salt like sodium chloride that contains one of the ions of the insoluble salt, and that would be the chloride ion, decreases the solubility of the insoluble salt. So if I add sodium chloride, or let's say we're at equilibrium. Let's say we are in this process. We have added, here's our water, we've added the lead chloride, and we're nice and at equilibrium. If I add chloride ion, all right, then we get an imbalance, and we said Le Chatelet's principle says the system shifts in such a way as to relieve that stress. So if I add table salt to lead chloride, this reaction is going to shift this way and more lead to chloride is going to precipitate out. Think of it that way. If you add either one of the ions that dissolve and they're dissolved in solution, um, they are going to cause and they're going to cause uh, this is going to increase this number, right? So let's look at the players again. Solubility product for this is equal to the lead ion times the chloride ion raised to the second power. So if we increase this, that's going to make it larger than KSP. So Q is larger. Oh, that's really bad. Q is larger than KSP, and we know if the reaction quotient is larger than KSP, the reaction shifts to the left. So again, what I want you to remember is this is called the common ion effect. We've seen it over and over again. This is a common ion effect on solubility. All right, so what is the molar solubility of calcium fluoride in a solution containing 0 0.100 molar sodium fluoride? Notice they use sodium here. Sodium doesn't react. Sodium is soluble in water, does not undergo hydrolysis with water, so it's a neutral ion. But we know that that fluoride ion is in common with those fluoride ions there and it is going to reduce the molar solubility of the calcium fluoride. So let's look at this problem. So the first thing you do is write the equilibrium for calcium fluoride. So calcium fluoride solid uh, becomes calcium two positive ions, aqueous, and two fluoride ions. So here is the solubility product expression. Looks just like lead two chloride or iron to hydroxide. I think it's funny they keep choosing the same system. So the only difference here is, is um, we know that if this fluoride ion was zero initially, the reaction would go further to the right to reach the solubility product. All right, These numbers have to get to a certain value to equal the solubility product constant. But we have, got, we have some help. We already have some fluoride ion present. How much? Well, the concentration of the sodium fluoride was 0 0.100 molar. So the constant, and we know that completely dissolves in water. So we know that the fluoride ion concentration is 0 0.100 molar. So now we have 0 0.100 plus 2S. We don't have any calcium ions. So we know the reaction at this point the reaction is still Q is less than K because this is zero and anything multiplied by zero is zero. So Q is less than K and the reaction is going to shift in the forward direction or to the right. But it doesn't have to shift as far because you already have some fluoride ion present. Now, looks like it's going to get complicated. 
uh, if you got 0.1 plus 2s and you plug it in for the value of the fluoride ion, uh, we're going to get a quadratic. All right. Well, generally the solubility products are so small, we've seen them, we, we practically say they're insoluble in water, right? So this 2s change is going to be negligible compared to that concentration. And then you go, oh, well, that's going to make it much, much easier. So that's what we have. We have S times 0.1. We scratch out the 2S. It's so small, but we still have to square it. So now we have S times 0.1 squared. We set that equal to the solubility product for calcium fluoride. You're going to have to look that up in a table. So we look up it in a table. I can't read the table. Or maybe you guys can. I don't know. There it is. What is that? 1.46 times 10 to the negative 10th. All right, I can read it. All right, so there it is. We're solving for S, so we got KSP divided by point. The square of 0.1 is 0.01. Plug in the KSP, the solubility product, divided by the uh, concentration of the fluoride ion, and then we get the solubility is 1.46 times 10 to the negative 8th. So that is what the solubility of calcium fluoride is when you have the presence of 0.1 molar sodium fluoride dissolved in it. Common ion effect. And you can, if you want to prove to yourself that, um, you know, this isn't going to be as soluble, you could do this if you wanted to. If you wanted to prove it, I don't know, did they do that? Let's see, yeah. For comparison, it, it, the molar solubility of calcium fluoride and pure water is 3.32 times 10 to the negative 4. So this is what it is. This is the solubility of calcium fluoride uh, in pure water. This is what it is when you add 0.1 molar sodium fluoride. So it decreases the solubility of the calcium fluoride dramatically. All right, the effect of pH on solubility. I, it's worth talking about this um, because I find students don't understand that um, when you add an acid to say like sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate, uh, it causes fizzing and it causes, causes baking soda to dissolve even more. So how does that work? All right, so how does that work? So when so for insoluble ionic hydroxides like calcium hydroxide the higher the ph the lower the solubility well that makes sense because let's look at it here so if you had calcium hydroxide and it looks like this and it's a solid and doesn't dissolve very well in water forms a calcium two positive ion plus two hydroxide ions these are aqueous yeah. all right so, in high pH, that means you have a lot of hydroxide ion concentration. And this reaction, um, it, it doesn't, the reaction doesn't want to go in a forward direction. It's like the common ion effect. So at high pH, calcium hydroxide does not dissolve in water very well. In fact, if you want more of this to precipitate out, if you increase the pH, you would force the reaction back this way and this would stay as a solid. But if I want to dissolve more of the calcium hydroxide, what, I, what do I do? I add an acid. It could be a strong acid. And now the hydrogen ion from the acid will re react with the hydroxide ion, and that forms water. And now we have lost the hydroxide ion concentration. And the KSP for this is KSP equals the calcium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration squared. Well, this is decreased. So if this is decreased, Q is less than K, and the reaction has to shift to the right to make up for that loss of the hydroxide and the loss of that number there. So by, uh, I mean, decreasing the pH, that's what I want to say, decreasing the pH, adding more hydrogen ion, um, we're going to consume the hydroxide ion, and we're decreasing the pH. And by decreasing the pH, um, more of water's forming and uh, less hydroxide's present and the reaction has shifted to the right. All right, 
Same thing here. Um, you have uh, a, uh, since insoluble ionic compounds that contain anions of weak acids lower the pH, the higher the solubility. So here you have something like sodium carbonate dissolves into sodium and carbonate. As uh, that's not a good one because that one completely dissolves. Uh, let's say it's um, here. Yeah, let's do this one. Calcium carbonate. There we go. So we get calcium two positive plus uh, two carbonate ions. Well, if I add acid, so this is chalk. This is limestone. You guys have seen, if you haven't ever seen it, surely you've seen where somebody takes a piece of chalk and throws it into some hydrochloric acid. If you don't, you can look it up. Um, or you can think of baking soda and vinegar if you want to do that one. But here's what happens. The hydronium ion or the hydrogen ion from the acid reacts with the carbonate ion, forms the hydrogen carbonate ion and water. So effectively, this concentration decreases. Q is less than K, and that means this reaction has to shift to the right to make up for that loss of carbonate ion. So when it does that, more of this dissolves. So that's how uh, the effect of pH affects the solubility of uh, a insoluble salt. So what I expect you to be able to do here is I give you a salt and you determine whether each compound is more soluble in acidic solution than a neutral solution. All right, so what you're looking for, you're looking for ions that would undergo a reaction with an acid, the hydrogen ion, and it would form a weak acid, a molecular weak acid. All right, so you look at this and you go, well, that barium comes from the strong base barium hydroxide, so that's not going to fit. This is a neutral, neutral ion, but the fluoride ion, yeah. Uh, it's the conjugate base of the weak acid HF, hydrofluoric acid. So this one's under going to, this one is going to be affected by pH. This is going to be more soluble uh, if we add more acid. All right, we look at silver iodide. Well, the silver, mm, pretty much a neutral ion because again, silver positive one, it's not highly charged. The iodine, if that's the conjugate base of hydroiodic acid, which is a strong acid. So no effect on pH, because hydrogen ion is not going to bond with the iodide ion and form the hot, strong acid, hydroiodic acid. So that's not happening. And then the last one, and yeah, we've already done this one. We already saw that if hydrogen ion comes in, it's going to react with the hydroxide ion and form water. That's going to decrease the concentration of the hydroxide ion. The reaction is going to shift to the right to make up for that loss. So this one's going to, uh, C and A are both going to be more soluble in acidic solution, B no effect. So these are fast problems, um, but you have to understand your salts, and that's what I kept stressing in that last chapter, is you do have to know your salts. You have to know your conjugate acids, conjugate bases. All right, try these out, hit pause, what do you think? All right, you should look at this and know that the carbonate is going to accept the hydrogen ion form hydrogen carbonate, so iron 2 carbonate is going to be more water soluble in acidic solution, lead 2 bromide no effect because hydrogen ion is not going to bond with bromide ion form the strong acid hydrobromic acid. All right, precipitation. I think we'll stop here on this video. I see that we're at about 45 minutes. That's a long video. I know it is. You probably want to watch this in sections. Um, but let's stop here, and I'll make another video on this part.